Looks like we're okay. Okay, I'm going to open council time for Wednesday, September the 22nd. And we are going, I'm going to change the agenda today because we're, we are running late on time. Uh, we're going to remove uh, in old business 1.6, our rules and procedures until next week. We will deal with that next week uh, so that we don't go on so long. Uh, so let's uh, approve the minutes of our council meeting of September 15th and the special, as well as the special meeting on September the 15th. Move approval. A second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the last meeting. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Abstentions? Thank Watch you. The yeah. Watch the meeting. Okay. Uh, moving on to uh, 1.2, CPACE Award. Good morning, Council. So I sent out the uh, draft CPACER ordinance um, that's being pulled up on the screen here. Um, just for the public, I know I've spoken to each of you about this, but um, this is an ordinance um, based upon a new state law that was enacted that um, counties have to adopt their own individual CPACER program. What a CPACER program is, is a commercial lending program um, for energy efficiency and earthquake resilience. Uh, there's a lot of different types of projects that can qualify under that. Uh, water conservation, renewable energy, um, wind resistance, energy storage, fire suppression. So a number of different uh, types of projects. And we know that there is some interest within Clark County of moving forward with these with this lending model to allow commercial building owners um, and some residential building owners, though not single family homes and not smaller um, residential properties, but um, allowing these property owners to move forward with these types of uh, loans to do these improvements. So my question for the council this morning um, is, do you have any questions about this? Um, and if not, are you ready to schedule this for a public hearing? Uh, in which case we would get it on the schedule um, October 19th or whenever the council would like to. Other questions about this from the council to Lindsay? Uh, yes, um, Lindsay, Councilor when... Lance. When we spoke about this on Monday, you said that you were going to be um, running it by the county treasurer. And I'm just wondering if we have heard from her about her perspective on this draft. I did send it to the county treasurer. I have not heard back from her on it. Um, I do know that other, of course, treasurers statewide have looked at this language. Um, it's been approved by Thurston County. It's in process in Pierce, King, Snohomish, Kitsap, Skagit, and Spokane counties um, with the same kind of language that, that we've talked about, but I have not heard back from Treasurer Topper yet. I'd say for me, I'd like to um, have that input before proceeding to a hearing. Um, that doesn't necessarily, if we want to move this quickly, that doesn't necessarily have to slow it down. I mean, it only been a couple of days, uh, but I'd say that just for, for my complete information, I'd like to, I'd like to be sure that her, her perspective is weighed in before, before the hearing in case we want to. Continue to do work on it. I will know um, we can get the hearing notice out. It would be pretty general um, in terms of the hearing notice. It would go out the two weeks in advance and then we would have to post it, you know, a few days in advance. Um, and so if there's minor tweaks that uh, based upon her feedback that the council would want to make, that would be one option that we could do. So I, I would uh, kind of echo, I would like, because and when we thought we were going to approve this months ago, uh, we're not on any specific timeline, but we do have interest out in the community. I've heard from the port. I've heard from one uh, manufacturing CEO that's uh, interested in this proceeding. I'd like to schedule it uh, in the due course, uh, but schedule it uh, and then we'll let the treasurer react to that schedule to provide us her, her input. I, I think there's enough time. I, I haven't heard anything from her uh, that's uh, out of line with uh, what the other county treasurers have uh, stated in, in supporting uh, their adopted amendments. So I, I would like to move forward on this and get it scheduled. Thank you. Uh, I, I, would, I would agree with that. I think we can get it on the calendar, but 
welcome um, Treasurer Topper's input. And if there are any small tweaks, we have time to do that between now and when we can get it on the hearing agenda. I will go ahead and get the hearing notice and we can get it scheduled for October 19th um, and then uh, hopefully I'll reach out again if we haven't heard in a week or so from Treasurer Topper. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the Battleground City Council open position. Um, good, good morning, Council. Um, good morning. So I did send, uh, City of Battleground sent down the seven people who applied for the vacant City Councilor position. Um, per the discussion of the council last week. Um, so today, um, I did want to also clarify, um, I know there's some discussion about how long they would be in the seat. And since it is a vacant position or a vacant seat right now, um, as soon as the November election is certified, that newly elected official would take office immediately. So it would not wait until January. Um, so um, with today's request, um, is determining who the council wants to bring in for interviews for that vacant um, position. You can also talk about interview questions today, or we could set up a special meeting right before the interviews to finalize your questions. I think we have, did, do we have like four people that have either confirmed or either through our office or or um, I know of um, based on what the city has provided, they had three that confirmed that they're still interested. One was only interested if no one else um, wanted to move forward uh, with that request. Oh, Madam Chair, I have a question. Uh, um, why are we doing this? Uh, we got a, a letter from the Battleground City Council asking us not to do this um, and to wait for the election. Um, they would maybe sit through three meetings um, between the time they got appointed and when the election would be certified and the new council would be sworn in. So I'm not, I don't understand why we're going through this. The statute gives the council 180 days to do this appointment and we're within weeks of the election. So I, I'm, I'm not clear why we're taking this path. Well, it would have been helpful if you were in the meeting where we decided to do it. So well, I'm I watched it, it, but I'm still not did. clear why you're doing it. It doesn't make okay, any next, sense to me. It seems pretty disrespectful to the me. city of Battleground. I, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilor Olson, would you please, when somebody's talking, I'd, I'd prefer you don't speak over anybody, me or anybody. So it has been decided that we are going to interview them. You can ask the why questions of us individually if you'd like, but uh, we have decided to do that. And uh, so we need to get this on the schedule. I understand, let's see, um, the, we have these, the, um, from the city of Battleground, we've got the, the uh, not resumes, but their application forms. I believe there was one person that I understood was interested and had somehow had not answered uh, the city of battleground, but has uh, indicated that he was interested. That's that is Mr. Dominic Vitali, I think. So I believe there are four then. It, it would be Karina Gibson, Carrie Hunt, Dominique Vitale, and Shelly Johnson, if nobody else wants to. So I think others do, so we can eliminate Shelly since, uh, and then it, William Swain, it looks like as well. Is that right? And Yes, and just to clarify, the um, other applicants, Tricia Davis and Christopher Reagan, um, they did not indicate that they didn't want to participate. They At the time didn't. that Battleground sent it to me, they had left a voicemail, so they didn't get confirmation on those. Chair, oh. I have a question. Councillor Lentz. Uh, at the meeting last week, the reason that was given uh, for moving forward with this was that the seat would be uh, vacant until January. That was the extent of the conversation about it. Um, I'd like to 
ask the question Councillor Olson asked, um, knowing that that's not the case and that this person will serve for possibly two months, if that, uh, I, I would like to ask what the, what the reasoning is for moving forward on this, since the reasoning that was given in the meeting last week is no longer valid. I think, I don't think that was the only reasoning, but I, I believe I, the reason is that the RCW calls for it. That would be my reasoning. Well, the RCW does give us 6 months and that. I listened to the meeting and paid pretty close attention and. It being vacant for a long time was the reason given. It has been vacant for a while and therefore. Because it's already been vacant, I think it's it's incumbent upon us to do our duty. Well, filling so, it now can't go back in time. So regardless of how long it's been vacant, uh, which we had no control over, uh, the fact remains that we're talking about going through an appointment process for uh, somebody who won't even be able to serve. I mean, we, we've all started elected office before in the first six weeks on the job, you're still trying to figure out where everything is and how it all works. And since the city of battlegrounds specifically sent us a letter requesting that it not be filled. Um, I, I do feel like it is uh, a bit of an insult to the city of battleground and accordingly all of the constituents uh, represented um, to insist on filling it and creating this additional distraction during this time. Did, did you want that in a motion form or? You know, we're, we're having a discussion about something that we've already taken action on. So in order to change what we've taken action on, you'd have to move that you don't want to do it. If that's what you want to yeah. do. Yeah, I, and I don't, as a point of order, and I'm not a politarian, but I mean, one of the three that voted to do it could make a motion to reconsider. I don't hear that happening. I would still want to go forward. It's really unfortunate that the battleground sat on this for so long. I think uh, the city constituents have a right to a full council. Uh, and one point that we haven't mentioned is, you know, the person will not sit uh, until after the election is confirmed. And, and from time to time, we have had elections, you know, they've been a, a couple votes apart. They haven't, there's been recounts. Uh, they haven't been confirmed for a considerable amount of time. So I, I would like to get the seat filled. I'm sorry it's taken so long to get to us. Uh, I think the city of Battleground has a right to have all their positions filled and even if it is only for a couple of months, uh, so be it. Uh, Chair, just a quick uh, point of order and clarification uh, for factual correction. Um, the certification of an election is a specific date and time uh, and it is usually about three weeks after the election. And so saying that it has, it has, does often take a long time after the election date, but the certification happens uh, towards the end of the month and that generally goes forward uh, accordingly. So it's not necessarily going to stretch much past that. So once again, this person will be serving for perhaps six weeks. So are we deciding Kathleen today who we're interviewing? Is that what you're wanting? Yeah, based on the decision uh, last week, um, it was decided to move forward with interviews. So um, yeah. and obviously if that decision changes, We'll take a different direction, but so um, if that decision maintains, it would be who deciding who will be interviewed and you can also talk about questions today, or we can put that off until right before the interviews. Okay, I think we'll put that off before the interviews and I think that we should put the 4 people that have responded on the list to be interviewed. If the other uh, people who have not responded to the city of battleground would like to be on that list, we'll add them. Uh, for the interview process. Now we're going to move on to uh, 1.4, the re bridge replacement draft resolution. If I can just for clarification for the record chair, 
Um, I just want to make sure we have a majority, which I believe we do on who we're interviewing, which is everybody who has already responded. Yes, and we'll reach out to those who have not responded at all. Do we have without uh, objection? We will take the people who have responded. Uh, no objections. Thank you. For clarity, do you want us to state the names? Um, I. I don't believe so because okay. I we have the list. I mean, I can say it will be we'll call Trisha Davis, Karina Gibson, um, Carrie Hunt, Christopher Reagan. We'll give the, him a call. William Sweeney and Dominic Vitali. We will contact him as well. Why are you contacting some of those that said yes and some that said no? We're only going to contact those who did not provide a response that were only left a message. So there's only 1 person who said no. The others were provided a voicemail and did not respond to the city of battleground. You can certainly just move forward with those who have confirmed with the city of battleground that they're still interested and not contact those who did not respond to their. Their call. So, my understanding is that for sure Gibson hunt. Sweeney and Vitaly are on the yes list. Okay, thank you. Item 1.4, bridge replacement resolution. Who's going to present this? This uh, resolution we've discussed before, this is just an opportunity for the council to come back uh, and look at this language and discuss to see if there are changes that you want to make or if you would like to move forward with this. As I mentioned uh, to you in, in a, a private email, I think it was, you did a very good job, in my opinion, on crafting uh, the language in, in good resolution form, and thank you for that. Uh, I support moving forward. I thank you, Lindsay, for the work you did on this. Uh, it seems pretty clear and to express what we had discussed. Madam Chair, I have a quick question. Um, and I don't know, Lindsay, if this is for you or for any of the other counselors. I'm, I'm, I have a question about um, item eight um, that states provide a high capacity dedicated guideway lane for CTRN's bus rapid transit when ridership is greater than or equal to 2,000 vehicles per hour in one lane devoted to auto and bus traffic. Here's my question, and there's another sensor. How is that to be uh, actually implemented if we're going to construct? a bridge uh, and this 2000 vehicle per hour CTRAN guide, dedicated guideway. I mean, how, how is that actually ac accomplished? So in terms of um, the effectiveness of this provision, um, I mean, I will note that the state uh, bridge replacement group met, they met last week or the week prior, um, and they're moving forward with a high capacity dedicated guideway. Um, as it's you know largely considered a prerequisite for the federal funding, um, in terms of how to measure this, I think that that's a detail that would have to be if this were given as the standard, um, that that's the detail that would probably have to be addressed down the road. Um, thus far, I, I don't see the state and Oregon, um, the state of Washington and Oregon, using this type of metric. So I haven't seen any uh, examples of how they would propose to do that in terms of their proposal that will ultimately go to the federal government. Um, but there's a, a wide variety of ways in terms of measuring CTRANS, um, you know, ridership. Especially when you have a point like the bridge, um, you know, how many people are on a, a certain. Um, you know, certain bus, how you equate it to vehicles, that's a traffic standard in terms of their average capacity of a person. Um, so it would be a, a metric, something like that. But I don't know if uh, Councilor Bowerman had a particular idea in mind. You're muted, Councilor Bowerman. <laughs> I think someone helps me with that and <laughs> thank you, but um... I, I believe I can be heard now. The uh, 2000 vehicles uh, per hour is a, a common automobile, uh, not standard, but actual rate that is um, in operation. And so 
this would ensure that a dedicated uh, guideway lane for CTRAN did not lower the capacity on the bridge. And um, that's one way to go at it. Um, I think it's a good way because it keeps consistent with the uh, goal of uh, avoiding congestion uh, and not decreasing capacity. And I would say that this is, you know, our resolution is saying our preference here. So um, that's how I would view it. We're, we're making a statement that that's what we'd like to see. Any other comments, questions? Uh, and we're, are we going to put this on a, a hearing or are we? Approving it today. It's certainly something you could approve today if you wanted to, or we could schedule it for a Tuesday meeting. Madam Chair, I make a motion to approve it today. Madam Chair, I think this is an important communication for the council, and it seems to me something. We, excuse me, we have. Uh, excuse me, Councillor Olson. There's a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I second the motion. Uh, discussion, Councillor Olson. Yeah, I just I think this is an important statement that the council wants to make that rather than do it at council time, I think a Tuesday meeting would be a more appropriate place for it. Um, clearly, it's going to pass, but um, but I think doing this kind of business in the council time sort of takes away from the purpose of council time. And it, it likely is a better place to put it on a Tuesday meeting agenda. Any further discussion? Uh, yes. Um, Sorry, Lance. I. I'm concerned that the list of uh, outcomes that this resolution puts forward, um, unfortunately, I think a few of them aren't based in reality. And I have concerns about uh, passing a resolution that doesn't actually engage with a lot of the conversation that is going on. Um, I'm very much in support of the interstate bridge replacement project. Uh, unfortunately, because of some of the items in this list of requirements, uh, I don't feel like I'm going to be able to support this resolution. Specifically, um, I think that having this uh, high barrier for transit um, goes against some of the goals uh, for having transit in our community and for decreasing congestion by encouraging transit. I also I'm hard pressed to see how if we don't have a dedicated lane up to a certain point, um, I'm not sure how a dedicated lane would be added after a certain point is reached. That doesn't structurally uh, make sense to me. Um, while I am supportive of ongoing conversations about potentially developing a, another corridor, I don't believe that um, it belongs in a list of things we'd like to see in design options for the interstate bridge project. And that's the language in the resolution that the Clark County Council supports IBRP design options with outcomes that, and then that encourage support and allow for a third or fourth crossing. I just, I don't think that that contributes to the conversation productively. And uh, saying that we are against all tolls. Um, I think is also not engaging in a reality based discussion. Uh, it's well known that in order to be able to afford this project, tolls are going to be a part of it. And it's not that I love the idea of tolls. I don't think anybody does, but I think that simply saying no uh, removes our ability to productively participate in the conversation and uh, work on mitigating impacts for our residents. Um, so uh, if this is the resolution going forward, which it does sound like there is majority support for, uh, I just wanna say that while I do very much support the interstate bridge replacement project and will continue to be a strong advocate for it, I'm not necessarily able to support this resolution at this time. So, uh, Councilor Lance, do you have the number of vehicles per hour that would be acceptable? Do you know some 
some figure that we don't? Do you have that number for us? Because you think, were saying that this is not reachable. Or I think actually to get to to the point that I'm I'm trying to make, I think that setting some bar for we can't have a dedicated lane unless there is X amount of vehicles. Uh, do, do you know goes what against that the idea of, of having strong transit access? So no, Chair, I'm not sitting here with a number of cars per hour, and I would say that that doesn't actually get to the point that the point of any kind of a dedicated lane were it to be a part of the conversation is to promote freer flow so it's it's not that well if it were 1500 i'd be able to support it or 3000 i'd be able to support it it's that i think that the concept is flawed okay thank you i, I appreciate that because it sounded like when you were speaking that somehow you knew of some number and therefore this was just not reachable. And then I would say also to your comment about, you know, building another lane or having another lane, this really talks about the dedication and all of the time on, on freeways, highways, lanes change for a dedication like an HOV lane. We use it uh, all the time during the day, except from three to six. Uh, for instance, on, on interstate going north. And so a dedicated lane still could be dedicated and would be built. It's just that if you don't have a certain number of cars or whatever, that you don't have that traffic to, to uh, warrant uh, a high density lane, then, then you, know, you use it to move other vehicles along. So I... So that's my comment on your comments. Any any further discussion? Just um, a point, the uh, 2000 figure, I may have footnoted that in the original uh, paperwork that I sent forward. If I didn't, I'd be happy to provide the source on that. But um, to your statement that this avoids the point, the point is uh, for there not to be a reduction in um, the, the people that are able to come across the bridge. And that is the getting at the concern for congestion. And if we lower the number of people who are able to go across the bridge, that adds to the problem rather than helping to solve it. You know, thanks for thanks for stating your position. I once again will say that I believe that the concept is flawed that having some kind of a bar. Um, goes in contradiction to the idea of supporting and promoting uh, mass transit. And I, I think that that is consistent with things that I've heard from uh, members of the board and others. Um, but again, uh, simply think the concept is flawed. So we're going to differ on that point. Thank you. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to uh, item number 1.5, the BLM process. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up from conversations last week uh, where there was a question on the VBLM report that will be submitted to the state. Um, I did confirm with staff that they're still finalizing that report. They're currently reviewing the data against the assessor's, assessor's database to make sure that the report is accurate. That is intended to be completed by the end of this month. When the draft is complete, it will be sent to the cities um, for them to review the data specific to their cities, and then it will be coming to the council to review the draft. Once those drafts are reviewed, um, the final report and a draft resolution will be going um, on a future council hearing uh, for that process. So I just wanted to um, just state that for your benefit as well as anybody who was listening last week on the VBLM process. Thank you. Any comments or questions by the council on that? I'm sorry, I think I probably just didn't hear it. Is it coming to council at, with a copy and to the city simultaneously, you know, before they make their comment and then after as well. Yes, that would be correct. We will send the 1st draft to the cities and the council at the same time, and then we'll identify what the cities recommend it. If they have any changes, what those changes are back to the council. And that will be approximately the 1st week of October. 
Um, I would hope so. I know, um, like I said, Oliver has been working with his staff to have the first draft um, done and ready to be sent out by end of the month. Thank you. Okay, the next item is council offices. This Kathleen. is also. Yeah, this is also follow up from uh, last week's council um, time. Um, just a reminder that we um, constructed 2 additional council or offices here on the 6th floor. Um, they have passed permitting space, so we're completely ready to go and moving forward if um, of occupancy. And this is just um, if there's a conversation or discussion on who gets what office um, that's up to the council. Um, there's. I think 2 counselors right now that are already in offices on that side of the building. Um, and so this would just identify those and, and then we can coordinate with. Um, the appropriate staff for those who have to move offices um, to see like where you want things um, and what. Furniture you would like to move from your current offices. Okay, I think we've had a little bit of a discussion about maybe how these offices should. Uh, should be occupied and um, and and it was suggested that we have we have the offices where the the chair is at the is at the in the first office then district one two three and four are in the following offices and uh, since those offices are are ready to be occupied um, I think that we can make those moves at this point in time. Are there comments by the council on that? Well, I, I endorse a simple approach like that. And, you know, if there are changes to districts and how the chair rotates or doesn't rotate, you know, that'll be down the road and we may have to change again. But I so office number one uh, would be the chair and then one, two, three, four. I'm good with that. And I think uh, I would like to meet with uh, whoever can discuss furnishings that will fit in my uh, new but smaller office, <laughs> uh, but that's okay. So I'd like to get moving on it and uh, bring some stuff in and get established. Uh, it seems to me like we have two counselors that were in the smaller offices across the hall. We have two new offices now why we now have to have offices in a pecking order is um, interesting to me, but um, you guys have already decided this and talked about this. So moving offices arbitrarily, um, clearly some will do it and that's fine. You're, I'll be moving out of mine, it sounds like, but I don't know why we spend our time talking about these trivial things rather than doing um, the community's business. Interesting, but it isn't a pecking order. It's just simply chair, one through four by district. Well, the chair's already in an office and so am I, but now we're gonna have to move because we've decided we're gonna put our offices in a new order. And, and I, I, I recall you, go ahead. Go ahead, Council Medvedji. I, I previously, Council, I'm surprised because you were the first one to say, hey, you were, since it was such a tri trivial issue, you were willing to move out of your office. And I am willing to move, Council Medvedji. It's just a waste of our time to have these conversations, in my view. Yeah. Right, so it shouldn't be such a big conversation. <laughs> Seems to me that it's being elongated by your comments. So, at, at any rate. Uh, I think that those of uh, the offices are ready to be moved, be moved into. Let's uh, let's do that when you're able to do that, please. Moving on to new men business, the Cominga Administrative Settlement Presentation and Settlement Memo. Good morning, councilors. Uh, for the record, I'm Laura Henry Sly. I am the interim real property services manager, and I am joined today with uh, Kevin Tyler. He is the interim parks manager or parks and land manager. So public works right now is we're seeking uh, council approval to support a negotiated settlement with the Cromenga family and sign the administrative memo summary. Um, because of the history that is associated with this parcel, Kevin and I wanted to provide an opportunity for council to ask questions prior to the October 5th council meeting. 
it's a little bit of background. So per per the county council uh, policy and our approved WashDOT procedures that we must follow, the public works director is authorized to approve administrative settlements up to three or 30K. Anything that is above 30K uh, requires council approval. Um, I can speak directly on the valuation of this presentation and Kevin Tyler can speak to why the why this um, land is valuable for the project for the county and um, maybe speak to the ju what justifications would increase or uh, would justify the increase in value. So the backstory on this, so um, Rebecca, if you could go to the the, the aerial photo. So, so the backstory on this was in the late 2018, a, um, a portion of the Kraminga family property was identified as a good candidate for the wetland mitigation within the Whipple Creek corridor or watershed. And this is in direct association with the, the upcoming 179th interchange projects that we have on our six year tip. This particular uh, parcel is a 62 plus acre parcel that is a, a remnant from the Ridgeport Estate Cluster Subdivision. Um, it's named after, it's the namesake is after the dairy farm that was present in the neighborhood for several decades. It is important to note that this piece of property is restricted and that is non-buildable, is heavily um, burdened with a lot of uh, conservation easements. And the only use that it could be used today is agricultural uses. So in early 2019, staff began the process of early acquisition to purchase a portion of this 32, 30, or this 62 acre parcel. Um, we performed the surveys, we wrote the legal descriptions, we hired a, an appraiser. Staff met with the owner multiple times for their input. So this was a collaborative effort with the property owners and staff to come up with the outline of the red that we have. So that was what we're trying to purchase for the project. Um, this was under the guise of the, a willing buyer and a willing seller. And so the definition of a willing buyer, willing seller is a well-informed buyer, willing but not obligated to purchase the property and a well-informed seller who is willing but not obligated to sell the property. It is important to note that the county would not exercise its right of intimate domain. We would not con um, condemn this. Um, we tasked a, an appraiser um, to do a before and after. This is traditionally called a yellow book. And how, how the appraisal, um, well, we determined a fair market value on, and, and concluded ag aggregate pieces of the appraisal. So it's important to note that it had wetlands, class, class wet wetlands, it had uplands, and it had what was left of the agricultural component of the of this piece of property. So in the before situation, as it sits today at the market, if it would sell for a willing buyer, willing seller, the the, the appraiser determined that, that it was one hundred and five thousand dollars. In the after situation, what the proper what the appraiser does in the yellow book situation is that it will, um, she determined the value of what is left. So if the county takes away, if we purchase the 36.75 acres, what is the value of what's left? And we pay that difference. We pay that difference. So that's the before and after yellow book. Um, the county's offer, so the cat, so the county's offer was based upon the difference, which the before value and the after value, and that was two hundred twenty-three thousand dollars. And we presented that offer to the owners on December nineteenth, two thousand nineteen. We've been in negotiations ever since. So the owners rejected this offer. They claimed that the appraiser did not value the wetlands um, for their potential value or future wetland banking credits, which they felt that it was valued at $190,000 an acre. Um, staff took an incredible amount of time to educate the, the, the property owners that the compensation can't be based upon a potential value or speculation and that the government, we really 
have a very narrow lane in which we need we need to abide by use pap standards and washdot standards and fhwa in order to deliver a capital project to benefit road projects so over the last year there have been several counter offers that have been exchanged over the value of the different components of of the the wetlands and the uplands the discussion of the uh, the the farming land that was left was never brought into the equation because we're, we're not interested in purchasing them. Um, it's important to note that the value of the class one wetlands was agreed to fairly early in the negotiations and we settled that for 11,550 11, acres, um, which equivalent, um, which um, calculated out to $147,000. Um, would you go to the next slide, Rebecca? I think we have this in here. So this is what we're purchasing, the, the lowlands through here. Um, the biggest disagreement was on the uplands where you see all those trees are. Um, that was that was the biggest disagreement, whether the value of those, the steep slopes where the oak trees are, and that, um, that was the biggest, biggest spread. So eventually, we came to a negotiated settlement for a sum of three hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So what this means in real dollars is this is one hundred and forty seven thousand dollars above the appraisal report. So that concludes my part of it. I'm sure you guys have questions and other components of this. I'll have to rely on Kevin to speak to that. Should we go on to Kevin first and then take questions or does the council have questions at this point? I, I have a question. Go ahead. I, so uh, the appraisal was done in a, a couple of years ago. I mean, yes. I can. At, so under today's climate, I, I don't know how accurate an appraisal would be in any regard. I don't even know how they appraise vacant land at this point. Uh, property values are so crazy and variable out there right now. Uh, my basic question, uh, other than the appraised timing of the appraisal, so I'm okay to go a little bit over value uh, in approving a purchase, but uh, this strikes me as, this would come out of our general fund. This looks like a conservation effort. Why isn't this under our conservation future program? I'm not clear how we're, you know, how we're doing this. So Good I'll, morning. I'll, if you want to take the lead on this, Kevin. Sure, I can. <clears throat> I can answer that, Councillor. Uh, Good morning, Councillors. Kevin Tyler, for the record, um, Parks and Lands Division of Public Works. And so this uh, this purchase is intended to be done through the road fund, with the intent of the property being used for a mitigation site in support of the 179th Street interchange projects. So the um, the property owners approached us uh, in late 2018, early 2019 about the acquisition of their property for a future mitigation site because someone had recommended that they consider that as an option. And we were initially interested because, uh, first of all, we don't have a lot of property in the Whipple Creek subbasin, and we saw these upcoming projects of the 179th Street interchange, which a portion of the the project falls within that uh, within that sub basin uh, of Whipple Creek. So, so from that perspective, it was a potentially desirable solution for um, performing mitigation. Um, we know that, as as you heard Laura say, it's difficult to value properties of this nature. So, you know, I don't know that I can speak to how we got to this point, but. Laura's good good at answering those questions, but um, I would say that the the hundred the hundred ninety thousand dollar per acre credit of wetland mitigation at um, local mitigation banks is a real figure. Um, so there are active mitigation banks in Clark County that sell wetland credit for that value. Um, we know that this site could be used for not just wetland mitigation but also um, habitat mitigation in support of our future projects. So for an example, the 10th Avenue bridge project uh, recently 
completed had two and a half acres of wetland mitigation requirements, but it had seven to eight acres of riparian habitat mitigation requirements. So, so this site has the potential to fulfill multiple needs for the 179th Street corridor um, and associated projects. Kevin, let me ask it in a different way. So you're buying it for mitigation purposes. Got that great idea. Uh, do we have to use road, road funds in order to get mit mitigation credit or could we use conservation futures money? Of what, you know, I, I'm trying to keep our road fund intact. I'm just wondering, you know, do we not get the benefit of mitigation if we were to conserve this versus this negotiated settlement using oh, road fund? The, the property could be purchased using conservation areas uh, funding but then it would be for conservation purposes only. So um, one fund cannot benefit another fund. So the, the road fund in order to use it for mitigation purposes has to spend road fund dollars in order to use it. They, they would be required, the, the road projects would be required to do this mitigation regardless and pay for it in one manner or another. Whether we, we buy a property and do our own mitigation site or we purchase credit from a local mitigation bank. Thank you. I think that answers the question. Well, and also to kind of dovetail and to answer your question about, okay, this is a, um, admittedly a stale report. Um, before we came to a negotiated settlement, I did reach out to the appraiser and ask to update this or what, it, what if it was worth it, to, especially in today's market, because it's, um, but he, it's within the range of the bracketed range of what we have. And honestly, I was pleasantly surprised to see there was a lot of data out there having to do with a uh, property that you can't build on that are just for farming. And there's a lot of data out there for particularly for purchasing wetlands. So there's, it's not a strong market for buying wetlands like this. There's not a strong market, but there is a market. So the decision from our department was not to move forward with a, a an updated appraisal for two reasons. One, we had come to a negotiated settlement and I did confirm with the review appraiser and the appraiser that, um, that there wasn't enough data to sway the cha a change in price. Other questions? And are we looking for an approval of this today or this is just a report or what? Um, my preference would be that you did uh, approve of it so that I can get a signed document from Ms. the Kraminga family ahead of the October okay. 5th. But this could be done in one fell swoop on October 5th. Well, if if there is no objection to approving this at this point, I don't see why we shouldn't give you the go ahead so you can get the signature from the Kamingas. So if would, uh, is there a counselor would like to make an, a motion or would you like to wait? I would like a motion to approve. We had two people talking at once. I just wanted a point of clarification. I'm sorry. So the motion would be, I mean, do we have to have an official motion to give staff the, the go ahead to prepare for a hearing where we would make the official approval? Uh, I think, I think it's a good thing to do. So we have a motion. Is there a second? No second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to um, approve this report and get the uh, signature of the Kalinga family so that we can move forward for the hearing. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Right, thank, thank you so you. much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Moving on to ARPA funding requests. Hello, Council. Um, so, in the last couple of weeks, um, staff has been um, discussing with the local funeral homes, the hospitals, or ME's office in Cressa, um, as our um, community partners are nearing or at capacity um, in their current morgues. 
They have also looked at financing, like what makes sense, whether it's um, leasing or purchasing additional trailers. If you remember, we do have one trailer already um, at our ME's office that we have been leasing since the beginning of COVID, getting to a point where there is not simply not enough space in Clark County um, as our death toll is continuing to rise. Uh, Cressa did some due diligence on their part to see if they could submit this to FEMA for reimbursement and it's not um, eligible and we would still have a cost and it's more cost effective if we were to purchase two, we're recommending or I'm recommending two trailers at this time um, versus one larger one, one for ease of use that we can transport using our current fleet um, to locations that need it um, than it is to actually lease it, um, lease out or to lease the um, trailers. So my recommendation today is that we can use ARPA funding uh, for about $177,000 to purchase two trailers to support um, this system in Clark County. There is also an option or an opportunity that we can actually lease these through um, interlocal agreements or MOUs with the local health care providers or funeral homes as needed um, to help recoup that cost as well. Um, I do have Dr. Malik on. I know his staff is on as well as Cressa. If anybody has any specific questions on this request, questions of council, uh, Madam Chair, I have a question. So, um, it simply deals with the cost. Um, the this is just a 17 foot trailer. It says, and the. Um, Cost of used refrigerated units out there is very, very, very low. Uh, right, you know, at, at, at most any time, but right now for sure. Um, has any consideration been given to that type of purchase instead? It would be a fraction of what is quoted here. And just to help me understand, you said a used refrigeration trailer. Is it specific for um, a morgue use? No, it wouldn't. I don't. I don't think they would be. But you add the trays and so on in uh, once the the uh, box is purchased. So I'll have to defer to staff on this. I do know that this total amount is for two trailers, not just one, um, and they are on short supply as well, because this is a, an, an, a na national issue that we're dealing with. And I do know that they are set up specifically. So I don't know if retrofitting a different type of cooler would end up costing us more money, but I would have to defer to staff to see if they've had any of that um, information. Yeah, this is uh, Dave Fuller with Cressa, um, Clark Regional Emergency Services. We actually did price out many different options and trying to look at that. Um, this particular option gives us a turnkey ready operation. The trailers come fully outfitted with all of the racks, the additional capacity that we need, the generators to be able to run them from a portable or from a remote location uh, and the refrigeration itself. Um, the addition that we have is that this is something that we can take delivery of as soon as next week. Um, if we go and try and find something and retrofit it, um, one, we don't really have the expertise in in house or in the community to go get all the racks and everything else that would be specific for for this, including some of the lifts to help assist in moving um, the heavy weights. Um, and so, ultimately, this seemed the most affordable, efficient way to to get that resource into the community. Hope that answers your question. Thank, uh, thank you for your your response. I did notice though that the generator and the lifts and the trays and so on were built separately. So that's the reason for the question, and that they could still be purchased and slipped into the the other box. But yeah, they're they're all included in that 177, um, including the the delivery of the the units. Yes, I, I noticed that, but the, the trailers themselves, I don't have it in front of me were something like 122 grand. Something like that. Um, yeah, and that's fully, fully outfitted um, and the 177 includes the, um, the tax. And the delivery as well. Madam chair, may I ask. Councilor. So I have a different 
focus of a question. So I'm not real clear on what capacity we have uh, through the funeral homes, all of the hospitals, uh, I know at least have some limited capacity. I mean, where are we overflowing? I mean, this is a, an awful topic, but I mean, I hate to spend uh, money on these vehicles if we really don't need them. Um, and I understand we're planning for more fatalities and, and we're kind of at capacity, but I don't really understand what the capacity is and how danger close we are to exceeding it with all the private and public um, facilities we presently have. So I'll touch on this briefly and I know um, Andrea is on as well. And you know, based on my conversations with her, our funeral homes are at capacity. And what I learned yesterday that I, you know, never thought about before is um, every deceased person ends up at a funeral home. So while we have people coming into the ME's office for um, certain reasons, some of those go to the funeral home when that investigation is done. Hospitals, when they have a temporary morgue where they put people in that, you know, but then they also get sent to funeral homes. So the funeral homes are at capacity now. And Andrea, feel free to um, share any additional information. Uh, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so in, in terms of the, the system and how the death system operates, there are three primary components in terms of cold storage available for decedents in any community. So your medical examiner's office or your coroner, uh, your, your hospital morgue capacity, which is very typically um, small relative to the other subsystems within um, the operating system itself, and then your funeral homes uh, and your crematoriums. And so right now, uh, we, over the past several weeks, are seeing increases in the number of decedents for all cause mortality across these three systems. At any given point in time, during a day or a week, there are interim strategies that each one of those subsystems can take to decompress and create more temporary storage. The purpose of purchasing these two assets is to place us in a position where we are prepared to respond in the event that the, the decedent surge outstrips our um, times one, times two, times three surge capacity of all three of the sub-operating systems. And I think what's important to note and um, something that is not typically discussed because it's not a topic that, that folks discuss on a day-to-day -day basis is really the purpose of the medical examiner is to take jurisdictional authority over deaths that happen in the community that were statutorily mandated to take back for purposes of autopsy and determining cause and manner of death. That means that if there are vacancies in spaces within our more capacity, either permanent or rented, the intention is you don't fill those with um, decedents where we know cause and manner of death, because if that death takes place out in the field and we don't have any place to store it back at the medical examiner's office, then you have to leave that body in the field or find somewhere else to store it. So these trailers are intended to essentially decompress incidences of sustained high mortality or single events such that you can allow the system to catch up with itself. So there's structural limitations for the system, and then there are policy limitations for the system. There's statutory regulations that need to be in place in terms of signing death certificates in order to um, complete disposition of human remains. And then there's also, um, you know, how many racks do you have within um, a local community or a region? And right now, some of our capacity actually is buffered against the region in Oregon, and they support us with um, uh, jurisdictional declines out in the community. Um, so they'll decompress those bodies that maybe the medical examiner won't take, take jurisdiction over, but then take those back either to a funeral home or a crematorium. So this, this request is really to be prepared in the event that we surpass our existing capacity. We also did make a request, um, and thank you to Cressa for this, um, for some state assets for support, to your point. We're running down every lead, and this is this is something that will allow us to be responsive in the event that we do tip our, our existing interim surge 
strategies. And it will also allow us to be a leader in the field in the event that we have future mass fatality events. So the utility of these assets will allow us to be allow us to position ourselves to be prepared and not just respond. So of course, no one on this call can forecast exactly when you're going to need this asset, but the trend that we're observing over the past three to four weeks and learning from our peers in Idaho and in New York, we have two options. We can make the investment using ARPA funds. We, and then option two is we can rely on our existing capacity in the community. Uh, Andreas, so you, thank you for that very long response. And m most of your answer had to do with policy considerations. What I'm really looking for is where are we at? It sounds like we're daily managing it. How many more spaces do we need? Do we really need two trucks? Are, are we danger close to exceeding uh, the capacity? I, just because the ARPA money is available, I don't want to just start spending it on stuff we may not need. Uh, so I'm just looking, I guess, for a number. What is the capacity? You know, are we 99% full? Uh, how many how many uh, spaces are in each truck? Do we really need two versus one? I'm sorry to be so pragmatic about it, but uh, I'm not getting a, a good sense for how urgent this need is. So um, I appreciate your comments too, Councillor. And if this wasn't an urgent need, I would not be bringing this in front of the council. Um, because I don't know the specific numbers, but what ha has been reported to me is our funeral homes and our partners are dealing with this on a day to day basis to maintain um, integrity of the deceased and meeting federal or legal regulations. Um, so they are. They're meeting those, but it's, it's very hard. Um, to meet those and so, and we are using the trailer at the Emmy's office that we've been leasing. Um, so, and I, if, and I don't know if we sent the graphs to you too with our death rates, but there, you know, it is increasing the healthcare. Community to my understanding is, you know, a couple weeks ago, they're like, we don't have room and they're working um, in other regions trying to maintain that capacity. But again, those hospital deaths. Um, and those who come to the Emmy's office, they all filter through the funeral homes. And um, so if it was not a concern, I mean, if we went to lease it, we're going to waste money because it's going to cost us a lot more to lease it than it is to purchase one. And we are, you know, like I said, we're able to, you know, come up with agreements with funeral homes and others to recoup some of that money as well. Um, but it's. It's very concerning. Okay, so Kathleen, I got it. It's urgent. So if we don't know any of the numbers, how did you come to buying two? Maybe we need six vehicles. Maybe we only need one. There's and some numbers. Right, there's numbers right there of the number of deaths that we have been seeing, and you can see the blue. Which, if you could scroll down a little bit on the bottom line, I believe that is this year. Um, so those numbers are up, and public health and our um, medical field and local partners are in constant communication. So if they are at capacity, they're at capacity in the funeral homes. I mean, I have, I called all the funeral homes or has public health called them all to see what the numbers are. No, but we're hearing the cry for help from our community partners due to the surge of deaths. And I can report that Evergreen and Cascadia are full and that PCC, who is our regional partner, is over full and they're deploying ancillary strategies in terms of um, putting uh, moratoriums, for lack of a better word, on the cremation of human remains that weigh more than 300 pounds because they take longer to cremate. So those those decedents are now in kind of a holding pattern. The families of those individuals will have to wait longer. Um, in order to um, transition um, uh, with that experience. Uh, and then also just rotating uh, bodies in and out of refrigerated storage while trying to manage overflow capacity or, or other um, strategies that crematoriums and funeral homes are using. Uh, so at any given day or hour, capacity will go up and down. 
and the amount of total number of um, racks that we have available to us in the county and then uh, regionally can scale up by times one, two, three surge, similar to kind of hospital bed capacity. So to, to, to give you a solid number, which I think is a great question, is not something that I think, so we're observing trends, right? Daily trends um, and, and then trying to forecast for how to be prepared uh, for future, future mortality-based surges. So okay. I have a question. So I'll, I'll stop asking questions. I, I, no matter how I ask it, I'm not getting any more specific answers, just a kind of a vague need. We need it urgently, got that. Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, to build so on, on your question though, uh, does a uh, 117 foot trailer accommodate four racks? So one 17 foot trailer, we've asked them to be equip, equipped to handle 24. Um, individuals, um, and the reason that we looked at two trailers versus one large trailer um, is is the ability to be able to move those resources or locate them in strategic locations. Um, so if each of my, the hospitals is having an issue or each of the hospitals is backed up, we can actually divide that resource and put one at each location. Or if a particular uh, mortuary or crematorium is having an issue, being able to put some capacity there and still have the ability to move. Um, so potentially, one that, one that, one, uh, sorry. Like so one of, one of the, accommodate 48 persons? Correct. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the, um, one of the other limitations we've learned through this process and, and Andrea can speak to it better than I can, actually it's the transportation of um, fatalities um, that is also a choke point for us. So the ability to move the resource closer to a location to be able to, to store them there until the transportation can catch up with it is also a, a desired outcome. Okay, I, I have a question. Just uh, I'm, we're being told that the lease the purchasing is better than leasing. And I, I think my question that was uh, ruminating in my head uh, was answered about the fact that we are actually using the leased truck. There, there are, there is need for that leased one. Is that correct? Yes, I see his. Yes, that his is correct. Statements. Okay, and then so uh, I think the question that I thought about immediately when I saw this or when I was hearing the report is, once we don't need this, how long can we? How how long are these trailers going to be good? What is the upkeep on them to keep them uh, usable in the future for some some other um, catastrophe or, or, or emergency situation? Do, um, do we have plans for for maintaining these vehicles basically while well, they're trailers uh, and what are those means of maintaining them so that we so that this is an investment that will actually last for us? I can let that that's, just... that's a that's a um, a great question, and it is one of the ones that we're currently um, working through as far as the maintenance and the the ultimate ownership of the the trailers. Um, Initially, we do have commitments from at least fire district six to be able to house them for us and be able to move them about. Um, the trailers themselves, um, we anticipate that's probably a, a capital purchase that is uh, on a 15 to 20 year cycle as long as we're keeping it maintained. Um, and it's really, um, it's really the refrigeration components that we need to make sure stay maintained um, and then the towability, movability of it. Um, so as far as the maintenance side of it goes, it's a pretty um, minimal effort, I guess, to be able to make sure that that, that stays in place. Um, we will want to set it up, obviously, for annual checks and tests and make sure that it does remain a, a viable asset for us here in the community. Um, and that, longer and term, we'll be meeting with each of the fire districts um, and seeing where we can Stick them because, um, frankly, that's maybe one of our quickest resources to get things deployed if we if we need to. 
And we do have staff in our ME's office that have been trained on like how to clean them and make sure that they're being maintained appropriately that way as well. And I'd just like to add to for this, the 17 foot trailers, just looking at the cost um, specifically, um, for one of them to purchase it's 64,000 plus a delivery delivery fee. If we were to lease it, it's 54,000 for four months and then 13,000 per month after. So we um, will have it paid for within the first six months. And like I said, and we'll be able to um, rent these out to other jurisdictions to um, recoup that cost as well. Yeah, that's that was going to be kind of a follow up because I also heard that, but you know, well, lend or lease to our partners. So that will that'll be commensurate. I'm hoping with what you know, basically our cost is at least, um, and and any ancillary costs that we have to bear um, for for that extra trailer that we lease to other. Partners, correct? Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah based on the conversations I've, we've been having with our community partners, this will be a community asset, including even our hospital partners, for example, in terms of, of, of arrangements here that um, we could get some compensation for as well. Okay, and so uh, are there other questions before we? Move. This is we're we're going to need to act on that. Is that correct, Kathleen? On this, I today? would recommend yes that we um, that the council approve this today. If there are no other questions, <laughs> I'd uh, entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the purchase of two refrigerated trucks. Um, with ARPA funds, all in favor? I mean, is, is there further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. Uh, Councillor reports. Madam Chair, if I could just briefly just add on to what I said this morning, because I, I can't recall if I had brought this up uh, previously, but uh, I did want, or it has been offered uh, to do a presentation uh, to the council on the health and issues uh, surrounding our aquifer uh, by Steve Manilow. He prepares, uh, he's prepared to give that presentation. He actually was on the original task force many years ago. He spent uh, decades looking at uh, these issues. So I, I just tossed this out there. I had met with him at his office and we went through all the issues and he that he teed up for me. Uh, I thought it would be beneficial to the entire council. Thomas, so council, didn't we have recently a presentation by whether it's our, I think it was our Department of Ecology on water temperature and all that not too long ago so this is a different this is the aquifer okay. this is the water below oh. the ground you know okay. based on right. our lifeblood and strategic uh, health of the water that supports our population in Clark County okay um if there's no objection uh, to to having Mr. Manilow come and present, um, it would probably be good knowledge for us to have. Any objection? Okay, we just need to get it scheduled. I, how much time do you think you would need? Um, it is basically how much time we give him. I, I think he said he would need at least twenty minutes, but I mean, I met with him for an hour. Uh, and a half, <laughs> but let's give him uh, 30. <laughs> okay, I, I can uh, send him that request. Thank you. We'll we'll have to look at our schedules and see when we can, you know, so that it coincides with ours as well. Uh, other reports. Councilor Lance, I had a question. Yes. You did you have a JPAC meeting last week? I did. I was just about to. Uh... Okay. I speak about that. 
So I did receive the directive from council to vote no on tolls at JPAC last week. I want to report that I abstained from the vote that JPAC held. Uh, and I want to talk about that because uh, the meeting that JPAC had and the vote that was taken was not about tolls, yes or no. It was to accept a report that was the regional congestion pricing study. That was a two year long report uh, conducted to explore congestion pricing per uh, requests from uh, the, the regional transportation plan for the metro region. Um, so uh, it didn't say tolls, yes or no, this is what they're going to be. This is Metro really isn't the primary, probably not gonna be a tolling authority uh, in, in most cases for most of the different tolling options that Oregon's exploring. Uh, I had intended to abstain from the vote uh, because like many of the things that JPAC covers, it usually uh, specifically refers to the metro service area, the three county area in Oregon, uh, and not to Clark County. And um, because I don't necessarily subscribe to uh, Clark County weighing in on areas that we have no jurisdiction over, uh, I feel like an, an abstention is an appropriate vote on that. Uh, in this particular vote, uh, the city of Vancouver and Washington DOT, who are the other two Washington uh, entities on the JPAC board also abstained. Um, hearing what the council discussed at the meeting on Wednesday uh, and wanting me to vote no on tolls, uh, what I did when I abstained is I did make a statement that I had been directed by the Clark County Council majority to vote no on tolls. However, since that is not what this vote was about, uh, I wanted to make sure that it was clear what the council majority's position was, uh, but that I would be abstaining from this vote since it does not uh, impact our jurisdiction. Okay. Um, why did they have ODOT, the city of Vancouver and Clark County represented on that uh, committee? I think you yeah. meant WashDOT, but um, WashDOT, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so that we can be party to, privy to, weigh in on some of those discussions, similar to how we have a Metro member on RTC. Right. Okay. So, is does JPEC also um, do? Are they the ones, or is it Impact that does the longitudinal study, like the fifty-year plan? that, you know, for roads, it's, I, my understanding is, is that one of those entities in Oregon, which it includes us, you know, RTC, like you say, includes Metro, but when they are making their plan, I've been told, uh, for instance, by ICC, that if, if this is the group that does kind of that 50 year planning, we should be talking about uh, you know, that third corridor across the river to be in their 50 year plan. But I don't know whether that is part of JPAC. Is, have you, have you discussed that in this committee? Oh, um, no, a third corridor never comes up in conversations with Oregon. No, I don't, um, no, I don't but, mean that. I mean, the 50 year plan is what I'm asking about. So, um, I don't know all of the ins and outs of all of the pieces of the Oregon governance and all of their different jurisdictions, but JPAC and MPAC both are committees of Metro. So it's Metro that is the organization that creates, that, that generates all of these reports and studies. It's not specifically JPAC, it's an advisory committee to Metro. Um, JPAC is the one that deals with more transportation issues. MPAC deals with more everything else. Um, yeah. So that I, I just thought about it, you know, because we have had this conversation with ICC. Kathleen and I meet with them on a monthly basis, and uh, we've discussed it a couple of times. And I, if if that's part of the planning on the committee that you sit on, it'd be really great to get get word in there to think about this. 
you know, it's 50 years out. If we don't, if it's nothing ever comes up, it doesn't get in a 50 year plan. But if, if that's not, it sounds like it would be because it's about traffic. So. I will interject here just to say, um, Oregon Metro does do a third, the organization that does the 50 year plan. Um, it tertiarily includes Clark County. When you look at the plan, it's very specific for the three metro counties, as Councilor Lent mentioned. Um, and then the Washington side is sort of this blurry blob. Um, and I'll also note that it hasn't been discussed um, in any sort of formal way since 2018, um, which would have been before Councilor Lentz's time on, on those two committees. Yeah, I under, and I've, of course it would be the Oregon counties. Unfortunately, when we have a bridge, it bridges from our state to the next state. And that's how it comes in is that it would end up in one of the other three counties. So at any rate, uh, if it comes up, let's think about bringing that into the conversation. If we could, that's, that's kind of the desire uh, of the council, at least at this point. And, and if it's 50 years out, we ought to be trying to get our two cents in there. So, thank you. So Any other? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, just I I I uh, I want to um, be clear on what I'm being uh, tasked with. What I'm hearing, and I just want to make sure that it's that, that I'm hearing uh, what you're desiring, is should the opportunity arise by my judgment to insert conversation about a third corridor to please do so. But I, I'm not hearing that I'm being tasked to go out and start those conversations. Okay. I just, no, yeah, I, that's, I'm, that's I'm, correct. I'm to, I think, yeah. Yeah. If the, I, my, my comment was, I've been told by Ron Arp that they are talking about their 50 year plan. And if they haven't done that much talking about it, obviously you don't have an opportunity to interject that I'm talking about when they are actually doing their planning that should should that come up I'm 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 fine with that and I definitely am fine with carrying forward the the majority will of the council and being clear that that's the majority will of the council um I will say anecdotally from personal experience uh in all of my conversations with Oregon officials uh from from some of the county commissioners to city leaders uh I've not yet encountered any appetite for that conversation. So um, I think that if this is something you you seriously want to pursue, that it probably will involve, it, it will need to involve proactive conversations on the part of those who are most interested in it. Um, that said, that's not me saying I won't, if the opportunity presents itself, have those conversations or bring bring those points forward. I just, um, I don't know if that's the solution that you're seeking. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Thank you. Other counselor reports. Okay, uh, Lindsay policy issues, or I'm sorry, work session requests. Yes, I have a work session request for um, council's consideration and it would be for next week. Uh, we're already beginning the 2022 annual budget process. And the work session for that is scheduled for the end of October with the hearing in the middle of September or November. My apologies. Um, the purpose is to provide an overview of the key items in preparation of our annual budget, which includes fund overview, financial policies, and property tax information. Um, I would be including members of the finance team, our county treasurer, and county assessor. I'm hoping that by having these discussions now will help with the um, budget process. So then when the council is looking at decision requests, um, that, that we have that baseline information done and that we have time before the first work session to answer any questions um, regarding some of the, the foundational uh, work that needs to be understood as we go through this budget process. Um, I'm looking for 30 minutes um, up to an hour, but, you know, depending on council conversation. I'm sure we need it. Any objection? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Set it up. And policy issues. Nothing further for me today. Thank you. Okay. And okay. So we are going to have 
uh, as I see it here, two executive sessions, uh, excuse me, executive sessions, two for pending litigation for 35 minutes total, a collective bargaining issue for 10 minutes. We will have an attorney uh, available. Uh, we will have possible action after this. So uh, we'll, we will come back to this meeting if we have action. So I'm not going to adjourn the meeting. What we'll do is we will go now to our executive session sign in. Okay. Thank you. To move to authorize the prosecuting attorney's office to add Clark County as a plaintiff to the lawsuit in King County Superior Court cause number 21-2-12147. Dash seven, it's captioned Benton County et al. versus State of Washington. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much, Council. We are adjourned. <laughs>